and welcome to Indie Social. This is the podcast where I, Dylan Yeager, and Michael Huntington, and Kevin Shepard, interview independent filmmakers. Tonight, guys, we have a very, very special guest, a man who needs no introduction, but we'll give him one anyway. He is a writer, <laughs> actor, and producer, and you've seen him in Quick Draw and 10 Items or Less. You may even know him as the original Geico Caveman. And he was born not even five hours from here. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Mr. John Lear. Hey. John Lear, man. How Thank are you guys so doing? Oh, we're doing good, man. We're Thank you good. so much for oh, uh, my coming pleasure. Here. Thanks um, for having me. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, when Kevin first mentioned to me that he was going to get you on here, I was super excited, man. So uh, very, very, it's an honor to have you here. And we're, we're excited to hear your story, man. Well, Kevin and I go way back. Yeah. You know, we to the old days, the right. silent movie days. Oh, dang. That's uh, a good time. We were that's both good. carnies together on a traveling. <laughs> hey, that's that's a good it. friendship right there. I yeah. Knew I knew yep. you were a carny. Yeah. Yep. So, you know how we start normally, John? We normally like to ask, how did you get into your acting career? What got you in the arts? I know well, you probably I, have a I, long journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was kind of, you know, I, I mean, I, I hear this a lot that it, it, it you know, it, 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 I kind of found my way. Uh, it, I, as you said, I grew up five hours away from where you guys are right now. I grew up outside of Kansas City. And um, I started doing forensics do you guys know what forensic not looking at dead bodies but <laughs> okay uh, no, there's another i know okay there's another forensics i don't know if they call it forensics anymore but it's like debate but it's you you do like monologues or duets it was like acting uh tournaments i guess and i got into that in high school and uh, loved it. It was great. And my I think they call it speech now. Speech. <laughs> I don't it know sounds why like they called it. Forensics. You did like readers theater. Uh, yeah. Like but improv, they called improv. it forensics, which I just do not understand. Anyway, uh, my my teacher, uh, Sally Shipley, who was this amazing teacher in Kansas, um, convinced me to apply to go to college at Northwestern, which is uh, on the north side of Chicago. And I ended up going to Northwestern. And in addition to it being cold as you can imagine, <laughs> uh, I it also had improv. And um, the school, Northwestern, had an improv show. And I, I auditioned and got into it. Could not believe uh, that I could say whatever I wanted, you know? And uh, it was, it, and, and then there, I started, I did that in college and then started doing improv in Chicago and was doing this improv show and got discovered by a talent out, uh, a talent scout from Fox. And she asked if we wanted to fly to Los Angeles to do our show in Los Angeles as like a, uh, you know, to show off, show, you know, like a, a showcase. Right. And we were like, uh, yeah, because we were broke and yeah, it sounded great. And so uh, at, at the time was the LA dream as big as, as it is now. Was it like, oh, I got to get to LA if I want to pursue arts? Well, we, I mean, we, no, Chicago at that time had this incredible theater scene going on. Um, you had Alice, uh, um, you had the Looking Glass Theater Company, which is still there, which was uh, run by a bunch of people from Northwestern, uh, most infamously David Schwimmer from Friends. Uh, you had uh, John Cusack's theater company, mm -hmm. uh, New Crime. So there was all, there was a lot of cool, there still is, Chicago's this amazing place, but at that time it was particularly kind of happening, but there was no money in it. You know, nobody made any money at all. So the idea of LA, while it was like, I wasn't really pursuing it, but the idea of, you know, having a chance to make a little money and get health insurance. I mean, we were, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, it, a version of it was, was still there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, your story is very similar to mine, but you're much more famous than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but my teacher also inspired me. I love, and I hear this a lot. It's always yeah. the teachers that inspire their students to go chase for acting. That's what mm -hmm. mine did too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got noticed uh, at a film festival doing a, a live stage reading of a script. Right. So, uh, so that's, it's, yeah, that's really interesting, but that's I want to go yeah. back to teachers and I'm hoping my resources are correct, but you used to be a teacher, right? Yes. Yes. Well, that's why I went to Northwestern. I guess I, I mean, you know, coming from Kansas, you don't really like, 
go into drama. You don't go into yeah, theater. Right. I like, it's not really a thing. And I, so I went to school to be a teacher. I went to school to be a, a teacher and I got my teaching certificate. I, I double ma- ended up double majoring in theater and I got my teaching certificate and I started teaching during the day. That was my day job. I substitute taught in Chicago uh, public schools in some really, you know, crazy tough neighborhoods. And then I ended up teaching full time for a couple of years, but uh, I was doing theater at night and, you know, that's what I, that's what I lived for, you know. Was it hard to kind of live that double life almost where you're like teaching and then also doing that? I imagine a lot of lack of sleep almost. Oh (laughs) yeah. And I was on drugs at the time too. So (laughs) I'm like partying until, you know, you know, five in the morning and then showering and going in and teaching and then coming home and napping and then getting up and going to perform and then doing it all again. See and, that already uh, already yeah. seems like a movie plot right there. Yeah, you know? there you <laughs> go. That, that sets it up as a good film. Yeah, it was it was intense, but you know, I was in my twenties, and you know, it, 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 that's what it was. What, How what long were say? you teaching? I ended well. I taught in Chicago for about I four years, and then I ended up going to L.A. And then I had this kind of you know, we, we, you know, we got discovered, you know, we signed with a big agent and we ended up getting a holding deal, which is where uh, NBC gave us a $15,000 holding deal. And uh, my partner and I, and I, uh, which was more money than I, you know, ever seen. And, uh, and, and so I, I, you know, explain a holding deal for people who don't know what that is. Okay. They really don't have them anymore, but Mm -hmm. at the time, uh, they, they would, <laughs> a network would pay you not to do anything else for any other networks until they figured out what to do with it. Wow. Okay. So yeah, basically, you got <laughs> they had 15, you on retainer. I, right. Yeah. So for six months, I, I got paid 15 K to do nothing. And, uh, and, and, but then after that money kind of ran out and, you know, uh, I ended up substitute teaching in, um, South central, you know? And, uh, you know, a lot of my stand up, I talk about that. And yeah, it was, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a so wild how, time. how long were you in that holding? Um, what, what holding, what was it? Sorry. A holding uh, period. A holding yeah. period. How long were you in there until you were able to start getting some um, good gigs? Well, we, it, the, the holding deal ran out. They couldn't figure out, we pitched around a show, uh, and, and we couldn't sell it. So it, it ran out and then we ended up getting cast on a show on e the kardashian network and uh (laughs) but this was before the kardashians and uh, they were trying to do a late night comedy show making fun of the news and they called Mm. it news weasels (laughs) (laughs) and it was just terrible i mean they they had really good intentions but they just couldn't quite pull it off. And, and, and they didn't have, they didn't have the news feed. They, they, they thought that they had purchased uh, the news feed from, I don't know, maybe it was ABC's news feed uh, so that we could use that footage to make fun of, but they, they screwed up somehow. And then we couldn't use that news feed. So this was during OJ. Oh, okay. And, oh, yeah, and, back in the day. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we couldn't talk about OJ because they didn't have any footage of it that we could talk. I mean, we could talk about it, but we couldn't right. show anything. So it was, it was pretty miserable. And you said that was a live show. It was, it, it, that one was live to tape. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, live to tape, which from our point of view was the same, you know, I so mean, like, yeah. like the way they do the tonight show and, and everything. Right. Yeah. So um, when you're doing, so I, I'm just curious at like what point, so you you got you got out of this holding deal and you were sort of doing like that. That was your first big gig in a way. Yeah. Um, how what was it like? Was um, did it stop after getting that first gig or did it just start snowballing until bigger gigs or what no, was that? Like? God no. It that that news weasels. Were, I think we did eight episodes, uh, and that took so that was like I don't know, my, maybe four months of work, three months of work, and then that went away. And then I did a couple of gigs. I, I did, uh, you know, some TV stuff. I ended up doing um, uh, Noah Baumbach's uh, first three movies, Kicking and Screaming and Mr. Jealousy and, um, and Highball. And 
And then I, and that's when I started to discover that I could write, you know, cause improv and, and improv and I, I wanted to do improv, but there, there was no way to make a living doing improv. There was no Curb Your Enthusiasm or any, anything like that. Or Reno, Reno 911 might've been around. Anyway, there wasn't much. Um, and so, but I discovered I could write and I started writing. I did some ghost writing for Noah. And then I, I ended up selling a script to NBC. Um, but again, I was on drugs and drinking through all of this. So <laughs> it wasn't until, you know, 96 that I got sober, you know, I got arrested um, for possession of narcotics in uh, Ventura County, where you go on vacation, <laughs> leave on probation. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so that led to me getting sober. So think, you know, so, there, so I kind of had, you know, so I went through a lot and, and then coming out of that was when I, I, I got an episode of friends mm -hmm. uh, and then I ended up scoring the show called Jesse starring Christina Applegate. Yes. Yeah. And so was, was that your sort of like your big breakthrough role almost? Yeah. I mean, it, for money wise, it, it's, it just totally transformed me. Cause then, then I had enough money to only do what I love. You know, I didn't have to work a day job anymore mm -hmm. and, and that, and I paid off all my student loans and, you know, it was crazy. It was crazy network money. Uh, even though it was just one season, it was 22 episodes and I made a shit ton of money and, and, <laughs> and paid off a lot of debt, you know, and, and now was, you were sober. So you got to enjoy all that money almost. That's you right. Know? I was really smart with it. Um, and, uh, you know, put a lot of it away and, and, but, but really it just gave me the freedom to now do what I wanted to do. Um, so then around the 96 time, or maybe it was, it's actually a bit before I'm a huge fan of, uh, Kevin Smith. Right. And yeah. I, I love the fact that he's very independent and he made his first film sort of yeah. very independently. So yeah. when you got this big role and you made this money, were you being the creative that you were, did you ever think I'm going to go out and like make my movie now? Yeah. I mean, what, well, I always wanted to, I did end up directing a short film and that was my first sort of, uh, it, getting into that world, but I always loved TV. You know, I always thought TV was, was so exciting to me because you could develop these characters for, you know, you know, hours and hours and, and, you know, seasons and seasons and that, so that already always sort of excited me. And, and there was a, a live factor to television at times that I found exciting. And I love that from my theater days. So I pitched, and it's just kind of where my career went. I mean, I did those films for Noah, but I wasn't like in the film scene. I ended up doing, you know, movies. Um, but at that time I was just kind of following, you know, what was being offered. And, and I, I pitched a, a show to Fox, an improv show that I produced and starred in. And that was like the beginning of kind of figuring out uh, how, to, how to do this, uh, this sort of what they now call sort of hybrid scripted improv uh, television. Um, yeah. I'm curious to how, uh, and did you direct any of those episodes or were you just writing those episodes? No, I, pr I executive produced and wrote and starred. My okay, partner, then Nancy, was my oh. co-writer and then she okay. directed so yeah sure yeah i would love to know the planning of that um we <laughs> we love like to uh, so i mean obviously we're on an independent route like planning is i assume much different than what it is like on a bigger scale what kind of work goes into planning a big series like that oh my god uh, so much and like I how mean, many months before you even start shooting not as many as you'd think. I mean, okay. we get like, cause, cause they have to pay, you know, people, everybody has to get paid. Right. So um, you don't want to pull the trigger on the writing until uh, the budget comes in and you, you got to, as much as like, um, uh, you know, uh, I think, let's see, how much was it? I think uh, 10 items or less was, I think it was like $850,000 an episode, which sounds like a shit ton of money. It's right. not at no. all compared, especially <laughs> compared to today. Right. But um, once you break it down, because it requires a tremendous amount of people to make something where you have to, a machine where you have to make it every week and keep it going. And it, it's a crew of a hundred people and you have to rent the location and insurance and, blah, 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 and pay everybody, uh, you know, 
So <laughs> tends to be pretty you, stressful, I'd imagine. It's very stressful, and once you pull the trigger, it's just like a sprint to the end. Um, so so yeah. then, do you do you get those moments of being able to enjoy it though, or much like me, I hate the process of making stuff, but the moment that you get to watch it when it's done and it's edited is probably the best experience of making something. You know, when it's over, almost. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because you you do mostly film, right? Right. Yeah. So, okay. So it's a slightly different thing because by the time I'm watching it, I've already lived with these episodes for so long. So by the time they air, I'm already focused on season two. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So for, I think for television, it's slightly different in that the, the most fun is on the set. And okay. when you're on the set and you're actually making it is when it's the most fun. It's very stressful. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's probably when I'm happiest. I mean, post is really fun too, especially for what we do because we write in the in in the edit room. You okay, know, yeah. Because it's all improv. We're cutting it together and and putting and creating it there. But it's it's also like long hours and it's, you know, you guys know mm -hmm. editing is uh so, I mean, editing is where also I get the most enjoyment yeah. too. I feel like editing is when everything comes alive and you're able to almost fix some of the stuff that you weren't able to do on production and right. find out new creative ways of making something true uh, more funny almost. Yep. You know? yep. Yeah, I love editing. Uh, so did you have a big say on how stuff was getting edited then? Oh yeah, I was the executive producer. So we, my partner and I were the showrunner. So okay. a showrunner basically means you are in charge of everything. You, okay. The network said it's our job to come in on time and under budget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you are the, uh, the captains of the ship. So Just going uh, back to uh, quick draw um, and you, that whole series was improv, right? Right. I mean, it, it, we would write scripts, really detailed scripts, really, but there wouldn't be any dialogue in the scripts and the mm -hmm. actors would never see the scripts. Oh. So, yeah. So now I saw it cause I was in it and I wrote it right. and Nancy who was directing saw it cause she wrote it and the crew had all seen it and the executives had all seen it, but the actors would just show up, get in costume, get in makeup and come on to the, you know, onto the uh, set. And, you know, it'd be like, okay, this guy is drinking and you don't like him. He's your ex-husband or whatever. Go. And, and do you guys give the actors like the freedom, like if they come up with something bizarre, like you keep it. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I didn't know if you guys had your limits. Like, okay, this is now you're well, in space. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> there, there are definitely <laughs> limits. Okay. And, uh, and, and, you know, that's, you know, my character in the scene would, 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 you know, guide things away from mm. stuff that, it, you know, just isn't going to work, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and people, but people are so into character because they've been, when you improv in character, I don't know, it really takes root, you know, mm -hmm. and these characters, re these actors really knew their characters. So they wouldn't say something like Mars because their character wouldn't, right that, you know okay but I, to give you an example to your point we had in 10 items or less there was a cashier named richard who always wanted to ice skate and and he <laughs> he brought that up we didn't write that in the script we never said anything he brought it up in an improv and we were like oh my god that's great so we ended up writing an episode where he you know, auditions for the ice capades, you know. And so tell me the blocking of that almost. So if it's an improv show, are you guys creating shot list if nothing that you really know is going, because it's really based on the performance, right? So it's like, all right, this guy did this. So now we need this close up of this. Like, how we, is the structure of that? We would, sh first of all, we would roll three cameras, sometimes okay. four. Oh, and, okay. and so you would have a cover shot and then you'd have a roving single and then you'd and then we'd always keep one single on me because i could uh cover for things mm. uh and then you'd have a fourth camera that's picking up whatever you know uh you, you know so and then after we would shoot we would go in and you know get a few cutaways so that, in case we need but we didn't use them that often to be honest with you mm -hmm. so um yeah it, it so but it was lit so the, so the scene, okay, guys, you can't go past here. Mm. You can't go mm -hmm. past here. 
So yeah. kind of give them boundaries so they don't mm -hmm. cross them, but like mm -hmm. kind of give them that free field to do what they want to do for a better performance. Right. That is awesome, man. That, yeah. that I, And I don't know if that's a trend now that happens more, like were you sort of, sort of the pioneer of that in a way. Well, the, okay. So there was Reno 911, right. Which was similar, but, but different from us in that, I'm a fan of Reno 911, mm -hmm. but it's different in Absolutely. that it, theirs was more single camera and less concerned with a episodic story narrative. You know, right. it was more like kind of a little bit more sketchy, you know, which was because mm -hmm. it was based on the show Cops, you know, it was based right. of the show Cops. So you could right. go from here to here to here. I mean, there which, would be through lines, but which not is sort of like the the genre of mockumentary almost is sort of right, yeah. when The Office and Reno 911 yep. was sort of at their prime. And then looking at some of the footage from 10 items or less, was The Office sort of any inspiration at all? No, I mean, it, it you know, the, the office in the States had not started yet. Oh, OK. Right. Yeah, so we yeah. were big fans of the British office. So sure, that, yeah. yes, that had some influence. But oh. even more than that was Spinal Tap. Spinal Tap was probably the most influential thing for me in terms of the mockumentary and using that uh, aspect. I just thought that movie was, you know, at the time, no, we, nobody would ever seen anything like that, you know, and that show, that movie was was very improvised. Um, you know, the, the office was not improv, you know, it was shot like it right. was improv, but it right. was fully scripted. And occasionally, you know, they'd go long on a take. So sure. It, that wasn't really we felt like we were doing something different but but i'm sure we were influenced by it you know it was all i mean how could you not be yeah. i think they see they, like the famous slogan is great artists steal in a way yeah. right you know you, you take inspiration <laughs> almost from anything to make something yeah, new course. in a way right but the office wasn't did not get great ratings you know it's it's later after the fact that the office right, has that kind, of, been kind of gained that cult following of what mm -hmm. the office is now yeah the kind because, of the take on the office at that time was eh, it's okay but you should check out the british version that's the right good one. sure yeah, okay. you know that was kind of the you know the and inside. the british version didn't even end up running that long right no he because ricky gervais do, he does is very into you know start and stop and, sure. and moves on he to doesn't try to like prolong stuff if he doesn't feel it needs to be or any of his projects i don't think i think they're all the, the his contract is look i'll do a different show for your network but <laughs> this one is only going to last whatever three seasons or that's kind of the british model which is pretty it's a pretty good one yes so yeah. i really like how you came back to improv like you started with improv and then with your with 10 items or less uh you started doing your uh improv again do you as an actor when you get a role do you kind of ask a little bit if you can have some creative freedom and since that's kind of your roots i mean most of the time the stuff that i get offered people know my skills so it's being like uh, the Geico caveman, for example, uh, the guys who were directing uh, the commercial, the first one, um, knew that I could improvise and they wanted that kind of vibe. So they wanted to get the lines and then they wanted me to do a bunch of takes that were improvised. And uh, so, yeah, I, you know what I mean? I get that kind of, it, people know when they're hiring me that that's kind of what I do, but I'm very respectful I mean, some scripted people do not want you to <laughs> dick around with their lines. And, right. um, and I, I don't when it's, when that's the job. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm super interested and we, we brought up the Geico caveman, which is what I know you like from, I mean, like I, I knew you from Ted Ames or less, but when um, Kevin told me that you were the caveman, I was like, Holy yeah. shit, that's the caveman. Yeah. So I mean, it was time, huge. It was yeah, such at a the time. Massive... Was it as like, was it huge or did it sort of gain like, the love that it got or was it like pretty much like right from the first commercial was like oh this is legendary almost I, you know the first commercial i didn't even know what it was i mean i was just messing around i i, I thought it was just a car insurance commercial and i was this weird you know uh, game Dude, in a costume yeah right. yeah who's like you know uh metrosexual and you know sort of intellectual <laughs> and sensitive um and and, and I did that. And then they called me to do another one or maybe they, no, I think they were shooting four off the bat and I did the first one. And then when I came to do the second one, by the time the third or fourth maybe was happening, my wife said, you know, I think this 
caveman thing is a big deal. And I was like, really? And she Googled it and it was just like, you know, it was just like, oh my God. I, I so then you really... weren't necessarily aware to how like viral almost before being viral was a thing necessarily, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it yeah, exactly. It, but then it became crystal clear right away. I mean, I got invited to the Oscar. I mean, it was crazy. It was nutball. It was so nutball. I did 25 national spots, you know, which is like, that's crazy, man. See, I didn't even know like how big that was. I mean, obviously that's what I remember you from the most, yeah. but like that is crazy how that went on to be such a huge thing. Oh my God, it's still going. I just did. Um, I, I, uh, I can see your voice on yeah. Fox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just you about know. to ask you, how yeah. was it coming back as the caveman after all this time? Oh, I, you know, it's totally fun. Because, you know, it's the same guys that do the makeup that we, we've all known each other for years. And yeah, it's a blast. It's, you know, it's a great job. I mean, I'm the most... I get to do, I get to be this, you know, ridiculous character and, and nobody knows it's me. It's, it's fun as hell. It's almost like the definition of improv, man. That's it like is. living, you know, as the character. Yeah. And so, they let me improv all the time on the, all, a lot of those lines and a lot of the st stuff that made the commercials, what they were, were improvised. And I'm sure that like, they got more lenient on it as the commercials, like as you sort of became the characters, like, oh, John knows what he's doing, man. We'll just let him kind of <laughs> do his thing almost. For right? sure. For sure. Yeah. So yeah. I'm super interested in uh, Quick Draw, and um, that that became a Hulu original, right or no? Yeah, yeah, it's still on Hulu. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, we Ten Items or Less had this kind of cult following, still does. Yeah, and Hulu had was running reruns of it on Hulu, oh, okay. and it was getting great numbers, and so they reached out to us and said. Uh, hey, uh, uh, you know, is there anything, are, are you guys, would you guys like to do something original for us? And we were like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, and, why not? Uh, it's Hulu, man. You know? Right. And um, we had just done a limited series for Sony. Sony was the studio on 10 items or less. Okay. And Sony had asked us to do a limited series for their portal uh, called Crackle. Oh, yeah. um, I think that's why I watched 10 items or less was crackle. probably. Yeah. Yes, it, okay. it bounces back and forth between Hulu and crackle. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. That's uh, it's absolutely right. And uh, so, yeah, they, it, we did this thing called jailbait, which was really dark. It was, and, <laughs> and it was me. There was a show called Oz on HBO, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, which was this hard core mm -hmm. prison drama yeah. yeah so yeah. we wanted to do the um comedy version of it okay and so i played this <laughs> guy who was arrested i was buying i was getting marijuana for my dad who had cancer and but i got busted and i got you know thrown the, the thrown the book the book got thrown at me and i'm i'm put in this you know hardcore prison and it's it was great it was so fun but so that was running and they had seen that and they and Hulu had said, look, why don't you you guys come in and do something for us? And we had been toying with this um, Western comedy. I'd always wanted to do, you know, something that was, you know, a historical comedy, you mm -hmm. know. And I was a huge fan of Blazing Saddles and I was sure. a huge fan of uh, Monty Python. And right. Uh, and so I had been <laughs> bugging my partner. Uh, to do it i've been bugging them all of them to like let's do this western they were like all right john and we finally shot a little sizzle of it and it was so funny and uh and we took so when it you in. say a sizzle was that before you ever got a budget for it then oh yeah that this well see we with 10 items we had we had we always shot something and this was mm. before people did that a, a lot you know this was you know this was well a while back and uh mm. and so and it works so well when we go in and pitch because we could give them the tone and they could see, you know, and like what you uh, guys are describing instead of just a board, you're showing them video evidence of what you're trying to do. Right. And the key was not to show them too much so that you could then, you know, and, and we kind of honed that. I pitch a lot. I mean, that's that's what I pitched today. Right before you guys, I pitched to Showtime. And 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 over the years, we kind of learned what worked, what didn't you know, what tended people, they, they tended to like what they didn't. And um, yeah, so we created a, um, a sizzle, I hate that term, but a, a demo reel <laughs> sure, uh, right. 
for a quick draw and brought it in and showed it to him. And then we gave, we followed that up with a, you know, a, a full on pitch and they, they bought it in the room and, you know, said, look, we, we don't do pilots. We just want to do a season. Wow. We'll give you, <laughs> yeah. we'll give you X amount that of show, money. Mm-hmm, yeah. And for that show, we were the studio. So we made the deals with all of the, uh, unions we the money got deposited into our business account which was just wow. terrifying <laughs> uh, yeah i bet man <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it was pretty crazy so you talk about pitch and sort of like so how many how is it at, at first was it scary pitching like was it almost all or nothing and if you didn't get that that pitch and you didn't get it to sale were you almost like discouraged were you like man i don't know what to of do next course. or sure Yeah, but it's also a lot of fun, you know, you're like, you know, you're in its improv, you know, basically Mm -hmm. you're going in there and, and, and presenting something that you really care about. Um, Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is do or die, but it's also about finding the right home. So if it doesn't sell, it's a bummer, but Mm -hmm. um, it usually ends up going where it's supposed to go. And I don't know, I guess you just get... I mean, the fun is creating the world, you know, and the, and then you go in and it's, you're nervous and you pitch it and yeah, it's. So then at what point, like, so I assume you, you probably try to set up multiple meetings if possible, right? Yeah. They tr- so, the agents try to make you pitch to everybody at once okay. with the hope that you'll get one or two people who want it. And then you can pit them against each other and get more money. That's their strategy. So then, uh, so say you run through all these studios and no one's buying the project that you're in love with. Is it just something that you set aside in hopes that one day you'll yep. be able to pitch it again? Yep. So you is never that heartbreaking, give man? Sure, it is. <laughs> that sounds so like, like It's like scary. writing, I mean, writing a screenplay that never gets made. It sucks, you know, yeah, but it, yeah. you know, what can you do? It's part of the um, game, right? Yeah, it's part of, it's your job. And, and, you know, the thing is, is that, I, I, like you said, it never goes away. I'll give you an example. We shot a little demo sizzle reel for this thing that was set in a um, a, a, a club. And, it, you know, we pitched it around and we almost sold it. I don't remember, but we all, we came close, but it just didn't go. And cut to a few years later, we were in a general meeting with MTV and the exec, and it was like casual. We were on our way to the airport. We were in a coffee shop and the executive goes, what do you got? We're looking for this. And I was like, well, we've got this thing, but I don't think it's right for you, but it's kind of right. It's kind of what you're talking about. And he's like, well, what is it? And I go, uh, we were, we were like, uh, we don't know, if, you know, if you're going <laughs> to like it. And he's like, well, send it to me. All right. We'll send you the deck, you know, the, uh, Bible deck, on yeah. it. And mm-hmm. the, and the sizzle reel. We didn't even pitch it. We sent it to him. We were like, <laughs> it's not what you want, but maybe it'll spark something. And he he bought it. Our agent called him and said they want to do it. So we never even had to pitch it. And this was wow. years later. And I, I assume think- that's probably a rare case, right? Like that doesn't happen very often, right? Yeah, yeah, that one. Although, uh, yeah, in, in, that it is rare, but it does happen. I mean, we pitched a show to HBO and I was so depressed after the pitch, it just went horribly. And I said to my wife, I, I don't know, man, if I can do this anymore. And, and for and six, six months later, they called and said, we want it. <laughs> That's and then, crazy, man. I know. And then we ended up doing it for HBO. It didn't go forward, but, you know, we got paid to write it and, you know, right. the gig. Yeah. And so, I mean, in that you just keep fighting for those gigs. I mean, even now you're still, like you said, you were just in a meeting, man, you yeah. keep going and going. Um, yeah. and, and that's so cool and motivating. And I, I mean, you speak often of this team that you sort of assembled and yeah. was that over the years that you would find these people that you really meshed with and you're like, all right, yes. I want to work with them more often. What, what was that like sort of assembling, um, your Avengers, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, there are just people that you, I'm very loyal, you know, and if somebody uh, works on a sizzle reel for free as a cameraman, I'm going to hire him, you know, yeah. because that's just the right thing to do. You did it for free. So we get the gig, you get the gig. Um, and, the, and these crew members loved working for us because we were really 
we weren't jerks and we were respectful and doing improv is so much more fun than doing scripted because it's different all the time. I mean, for the crew, they're like, Oh my God, that's hilarious. Um, and then you kind of, it's such a weird skill, um, in all the departments, all of them, uh, acting through post, it's a different skill. So you end up finding people who can do it and people who can't do it. And, and, you know, and then you hold on to those who can and those who kill at it. Yeah. I still work with the same, uh, people, you know, if I sell this thing I pitched today, it'll be, it'll be, you know, it's uh, cool that you have that amount of control almost because I mean, you know, us not have having that level yet. I've always wondered the amount of control you have with your projects that you're able to sort of bring on that crew that you love working with. That's very Well, I mean, the, 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 the buyer needs to approve it all. I mean, sure. it's, it's, it's not just like, Hey, you know, I'm not at that level. I mean, there okay. are people at that level, but <laughs> right. they need to prove it all, but you know, it's good business. I mean, these are people, you know, it's not like you're saying, Hey, hi, my cousin i'm saying hey hire this guy who worked on these projects sure. this is why i think he's right for this or, or she and, and they have the resume to back it right and like exactly. that's why you're fighting for them anyway and that's why even when you hit them up for that sizzle reel you know that you're going to go with them because they also have the resume to back up you know right over the years we've kind of all come up together and um we trust each other you know so, so, the, so the network generally wants that to happen especially the stuff that happens on the set they want you to have your people because they they're buying you you know right and they want you to have a good time they don't want you to work with people that you've never worked with maybe because then there's this, this awkward moment of like you know i don't know how they work like what's their workflow what's their attitude towards certain stuff like are we going to mesh well yeah i assume that they would want you to have like your your crew that you would prefer occasionally they they shove stuff down your throat and you know that's just part of it and the you're business. like okay <laughs> We'll, yeah. we'll work with this person. One thing I was curious about, if you could um, kind of elaborate a little bit more, like I was a fan of yours when I saw you on Jesse back in the day. Oh and my God. When I'm watching you as you do like TV appearances and things. And then um, Nancy, was it Nancy Howard? Howard? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sh your, your names were always connected on several projects for a period there. Um, yeah. How did, how did that happen? Like, how did you and her meet run into each other and realize it clicked and, and what's the story there? She was directing a movie, uh, an independent movie that never got released um, because 9-11 happened. And, and this is how long ago it was. And, uh, and it never got released, but we did a scene together in, and I, she just brought me on for a scene and she said, okay, now let's improv. And I started to improvise and it was like what we were talking about before when you find somebody who gets it, you know, and she got it unlike anybody I'd ever met got it. And she's a super talented, you know, director, editor, you know, she's like a one man band, you know, like me, you know, we, we like to wear many hats. And um, she then did a, a, a movie uh, that I was in a producer on it and, and starred in it or was part of the, you know, the cast. It was an ensemble. Is that Memron? And, and that was Memron. Yeah. yeah. And then that ended up winning slam dance, which really got us our pitch for 10 items. Yeah. And, and okay. so we just kind of, and we just loved working together. You know, we're just like, you know, it's just one of those beautiful things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So we actually have a, a decent amount, unless you guys have any more questions, we have a decent amount of viewer questions that want to ask you some stuff. Ooh. Uh, I got one that's off topic sure. of film, but I'll, I'll save that before we wrap. Okay, cool. Okay. So um, Brittany Benedict here says, when you get to it, I'd love to know John's proudest achievement regarding projects he's worked on. Wait, so repeat the question. You broke up there just for a sure. second. Yeah. So uh, Brittany Benedict asked, um, when you get to it, I'd love to hear John's proudest achievement regarding projects he's worked on. Proudest achievements. I mean, oh my God, you know, because I mean, I would definitely go to the things that, you know, that I wrote and developed as my, but to pit one, I guess quick draw. I mean, quick draw was so fun just because it was I mean, we had stunts, you know, we had comedians on horses, we had firearms, we had cowboy. <laughs> I mean, we were killing people, we were blowing stuff up. I mean, it it's just, it was just so challenging and so fun. But man, it's hard for me to pick a favorite, really. 
so then uh, I'm also interested. So after you have like this amazing time filming this stuff, is there this moment of almost depression that you get when it's wrapped? totally, oh, totally, yeah, totally. It's like what just happened? What uh, all it's of like that? losing a loved one? Almost. Yeah, it's, it's like just, all the yeah. joy I had for six months is now like gone. Yeah, and it's now I have to find this new, you know, totally. this new muse. Totally. But the weird thing is, is it gets dragged on because you're never really finished. You're like, okay, uh, we got to pitch it. I hope they buy it. Then they buy it. I hope they make a series. Oh, they picked up the series. Oh, I hope they like the scripts. Okay. They signed off on the scripts. I hope the, you know, the numbers are good. Okay, great. I hope we get picked up for season two. You know what I mean? It's constantly wishing or thinking about the thing you're never enjoying the moment you're always being forced to like move on worry to the next about thing the, almost. what's gonna yeah <laughs> sure so it must be overwhelming Fortress. if you're doing multiple yeah. projects and you have mul- like that same thought process going on with multiple yeah. projects I, yeah. I can see that getting very overwhelming it's um, yeah there's just not enough hours in the day and and you're just exhausted all the time and we have another question here from i believe darlene smith Oh, Darlene. I know Darlene. She says, question for John. Um, what do you find more rewarding, acting, writing, or producing? Ooh. I mean, I love improvising, which is, for me, is kind of like um, taking the writing and presenting it. So it's what I've written. It's what I've come up with, and I'm presenting it in on the fly. That's the way I kind of view it. So it's almost like I'm in a writer's room, and I'm pitching it, but I just happen to be in makeup, <laughs> you know, while I'm doing it. So that I love. Producing, I have grown to love a lot. But but in the beginning, the only reason I produced was because it was the only way to get my stuff done. Um, but I've had kind of a, um, an experience with producing where I realized, oh, my God, you know, I'm responsible. These people are all paying their bills because of me, you know. And or or partially because of me, right, or I right. could fuck it up. I guess is a better way to put it. I could right. screw it up. And I had this change where I was like, instead of initially, I thought, okay, their job is to sort of execute my vision. Now that has not the case for me. Now what I do is I look for what they do best, and I try to amend or adapt my vision to what they do best to get the most out of them. So it's a fully collaborative thing where, oh my God, you're so good at this. Okay. I'm going to exploit that because it'll be the, it'll be best for the show, you know? Uh, And that's been like, that's what I love about, about producing. Um, And then, so we also have another question here from Darlene. She says, um, how did you become partners with Nancy Hauer? And just to add on to that, um, was Nancy Howard your first creative partner, you'd say? No, I, I mean, my life has been very collaborative. I, I would say my first partner was, um, uh, was in college. I did a two-person stand-up show uh, with Jerry Saslow. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I was in improv groups, which was always collaborative, you know? So, like, I've never, I mean, I've, I've written some stuff just by myself, but I, I love working with people a whole lot more but nancy is by far the more most important uh partner i've ever had for sure is she like is she your longest running creative partner oh, yeah. You'd say? oh yeah for sure so yeah what is um that like in the amount of um trying to think of the word here like it, does it make life easier being to like share the the amount of weight you have on your guys shoulders like to have that Absolutely. partner working with a partner is I highly recommend it because it could this business can be very um you know it's very fear-based you know and crazy stuff is happening all the time and you can go down these wormholes and to have somebody there who's like sees it slightly differently can really help uh in terms of just the psychological aspect of working in this field um, and then, you know, I, I, again, I just love collaborating, you know, and, and yeah. So, um, yeah, I recommend it, you know, um, it, it's, so it, it's, it's collaborating for, with us and our team. Like, um, we always have this thing, like we never try to, um, 
like, unless we have our hills to die on, that's what we say. Like <laughs> we never try to, we always go with who has the best idea. Like we never try to have too much of an ego, right? Yeah. Unless they have this hill that they're dying on that they're like, no, this yeah. has to be it. Do yep. you sort of have a similar workflow with your partners like that? Like, no, yes. this has to be it. Yes. I mean, all the time. And and then I'm wrong. And, <laughs> you know, and it's like a marriage, you know, it takes constant communication and attention to people's feelings. And, you know, and, if, and once you give up on that, then you're you're cooked. You know, once you stop caring about each other, then you're cooked. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we have another question here. Um, ask him about the fans trying to get Hulu to sign on another season. Um, we all sent this company ginger snaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When Hulu, when, uh, when uh, quick draw was canceled, there was this huge, there was a, there still is this huge, um, or, or, you know, a, 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 you know, fans that love the show. And uh, and when it got canceled, my character loved ginger snaps in in it. So they all started sending boxes of ginger snaps uh, to Hulu, which was so awesome. I mean, they're just incredible. I mean, that's why I do it for to have to be in contact with people like that. I love that, you know. So talk a little bit, a little bit about um, when something gets canceled. Like, are you well aware of that? before the show ends or is like the show ends, they run their numbers and then it's something that can happen that you get canceled. Yeah. That's really what it is. They'll, they'll finish it off and then they'll make a decision whether they're going to pick it up or not. And that the kind of classic time period to do that is usually at the upfronts, uh, which is where the networks present their new slate uh, to the advertising agencies. Um, that's when you'll learn. You either go to the ump fronts, which means you're picked up, or you don't, which means you're canceled, you know? Um, some uh, executives will call you and, and, and say, you know, hey, I'm sorry. And, and, but a lot of the times you won't hear anything. You'll hear it from your agent later. You know, they won't even wow. let you know. Yeah. So, and then at so, that point, uh, are you already writing a second season in hopes no. that no okay i mean but 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 yeah of course you're thinking about it but yeah sure. you 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 learn the hard way not to get too into it till the trigger's pulled okay. uh because you know then it's even harder but you can't help it i mean i i could pitch a third season to quick draw right now you know mm -hmm. uh because i've been thinking about it um but uh yeah it's 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 brutal it's brutal when especially when it's your baby when you're an actor on a show it's a bummer um but it's different it's different um let me see uh we have uh, another question here um who would you like to work with in the future i'm sure you have a laundry list of that right <laughs> god yeah oh my god um or more so have you had that moment where you're like Shh, i really want to work with this person and you got that opportunity has that happened with yes. you yet yes oh yeah many times um I, I'm trying to think of the, like the top one. Um, I, well, I, I mean, Jesse, I worked with George Zunza and he was in uh, deer hunter and I was just like, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm um, Eric Stoltz uh, was in one of the first movies I was in and I loved his, his career and, 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 and all of that. Um, I worked, uh, I mean, uh, Christina Applegate, I was so into, you know, uh, the family, uh, what was the show? God, um, I'm, uh, the Fox show that she was in. I mean, I- Married with oh, children. Married with children. Justine Bateman, I worked with her and I was a big fan of hers. Uh, um, Jack Black, oh, amazing. Yeah. You know, amazing. Um, yeah, so many, so many. Yeah, I bet it's hard and it continues to grow, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. And, but, but, but just connecting with anybody and, you know, just an actor, a journeyman actor, you know, uh, mm -hmm. where you're like, oh my God, this is, and it happens in improv so much. Bob Clendenin, why haven't I said Bob Clendenin's name? Uh, he uh, has been, he was in, he's in everything that, that uh, I've produced. And um, he's just this amazing actor who's just always good always <laughs> yeah and you just keep them on you man because you know that all right this guy's gonna be perfect for this role and i already know right i write roles for him i build yeah. shows around him i mean <laughs> right. you know we've we've created stuff for him because we know 
his talent will make money for us. <laughs> so <laughs> then exploit him. being a producer then and being an executive producer, I imagine you have that call on casting. Yeah. Yeah. That's so a big talk about um, what is it like to tell a fellow actor or to let a fellow actor know that they maybe not have got that role. Is that hard on you personally <laughs> being in that position? Oh, for before? sure. For sure. For sure. Cause we're, I'm an actor. So right. I know, I mean, we're, you know, we're so, I'm so codependent uh, for actors who are auditioning and cause I know what it's like. Yeah. And, and so I usually improvise with all of them in the scene and, and do my best. So much a part of successful improv is making your partner look good. Mm. And that's really my focus most of the time. Um, and so, yeah, but it's brutal. I mean, you know, actors don't want uh, to, you know, a big deal being made out of them, not getting the part, you know, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, you know, uh, more, more often than not. And, and when it's just, you could, cause you could come in once, maybe twice, uh, maybe three times. If it's for a, a series regular, those people we would talk to and say, listen, I'm sorry. And, you know, but somebody who just comes in once for a guest right. spot, you know, the casting director just tells their agent and that's probably for the best for everybody concerned. Cause it's just like, okay, whatever. I, you know, it happens to actors oh, dozens more than, of times yeah, a every week. Day. <laughs> but the thing I love is when you cast somebody as a series regular and they have, especially if they haven't ever done anything anymore it, before. And mm. I love calling them. I'll call them, right. you know, and I love that moment. That is the best. It's the best. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine, man, because like, yeah, I mean, because sometimes it's just like, it's one of the, like the bigger roles they've been in. So to be able to get like, you, oh, to my let God. them know, you know, like, hey, man, you're in this. Like, There's an actor on 10 items uh, who had never done anything before. And I called his home to tell him and he was living with his parents still, I think, <laughs> or family. And and I, I called and asked for him, Greg Davis, by the way, who played, who was in 10 items or less. He played Buck the bag boy. It was, okay. and it was yeah, his yeah. first gig. He was a great guy. And I called his home and his cousin answered. She said, Oh no, he's at work. Uh, would you like that number? And I was like, Oh no, just tell him. And I was like, yes, yes I would like that, that number. number. <laughs> and so I called him at work. His man, he worked at a restaurant, his manager, you know, whoever answered, I said, can I talk to Greg Davis? He came. <laughs> I said, this is John Lear. You got the part. And he's like, what? You know, he was just <laughs> like, his mind was blown. And, you know, of course, like any actor, he just walked out immediately and quit the job. Yeah, he's like, I'm uh, done, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to go. I'm going to be on TV. Right. Yeah. Um, Table five so needs I fries. I'm out. Thing for sure. It's that? so, it's such a great moment. It's such a great. Oh, moment. I can't imagine. Tell somebody. Um, we have a question here um, from Eric. Uh, Oh man, I'm gonna mess up his name. Gilland, maybe. Uh -huh. That is Eric Gilliland, who is a huge showrunner. Who, uh, yeah, he's a, a well. Google he said uh, he said here, uh, wouldn't he like to work with Eric? Yes, <laughs> yes, Eric, I would. Uh, and then uh, Shannon, I believe, is like, "Are you friends on Facebook?" He's like, "No, we're actually friends." <laughs> so they're having a little yeah. debate here. So I uh, kind of, uh, I Eric Eric Gilliland, it, it was uh, has, I mean, you, his IMDb page is incredible. He was on Rose, he ran Roseanne. I mean, he was, you know, he's huge. Yeah, huge, yeah. huge, huge guy. Um, but what I know. Mm -hmm. is that he's a great improviser and yeah. uh i want to get him i i don't want him for a show although yeah but i want <laughs> sure you take him <laughs> i've been trying to get him on camera so and one day i will be successful <laughs> yeah um, he's amazing so recently you you brought it up that you were on um that, that the voice show i'm sorry i'm forgetting the name. oh i can see your voice yes no, i can see I had your never voice. heard of it uh, until um, i was on it so uh, Millennium Knight here says your singing talent was unexpected. You gave it your all. Yes. <laughs> yes. So was there any training into that? Are you a naturally, <laughs> are you naturally good at singing? I'm not sure how I'm supposed to talk about this. I mean, 
Because it's, a, do you know what the show is? It's, it, 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 people go on, they right. sing, and you try to guess whether they're really singing or they're lip syncing. Oh, right. So should yes. I say what happened? Maybe I mean, not. It's already aired. Oh, it I don't has aired? know how to handle this stuff. I, okay. I anyway. think you should save that beauty for the people who get to see it for themselves. <laughs> yeah, there <laughs> sure. you go. Yeah, We won't spoil that. Millennium Night, yeah. you'll have yeah. to check it out. But it was a blast. And I, it was as the Geico Caveman, so it, it was a yeah. blast. It was a blast. Yes, um, phenomenal job. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll let you do your question, Dylan. Sorry. Yeah, so I found something interesting about you on the Uh-oh. internet. <laughs> oh, boy. That, that's everyone's favorite sentence. I found something interesting <laughs> about you on the internet. Sure so, is. You found out about the porn. <laughs> Listen, Uh-oh. I was broke. I need it. We'll actually have a link down in the description if anyone wants to check that out. <laughs> no, trust me, nobody's gone starting his OnlyFans soon. <laughs> Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. This is a question that I wrote. (laughs) I was like, where is it? (laughs) All right. So, yeah, you signed on as a supporter for Alley Cat Allies, which is a nonprofit advocacy organization dedicated to transforming communities to protect and improve the lives of cats. Yeah. And you joked as and you joked saying as a fertile, fertile human, I feel deep for a deep connection with these animals. So yeah, tell me more about your love for cats and what this organization is. Listen, meant, the only so person much. who doesn't love a cat is someone who's never had one. Once That's what I'm had saying. A cat, yeah. They're awesome. Uh, so, you know, that, that's the thing about that's I, and I, now I don't have a cat. I have two dogs because I live near Griffith park and there's coyotes. So cats don't live long in my neighborhood. Yeah. So it would have to be an indoor cat which my son is making a play for, but I know what goes on at this house and people don't close the door. You know, the cat will get out and then the cat will get, get eaten. And I don't want that to happen, but yeah, that'd be tragic. But I had a cat for many, many years who I just, you know, just, we got through a lot together, me and that cat. Um, and Alley Cat Allies is this great organization that, you know, helps to, um, you know, get fix cats at so they don't uh you know so that and helps with helps getting them adopted and they're amazing and um becky robinson who's um the person uh behind alley cat allies is um uh was an old friend of my mom's too so there's a double connection there sure my son's coming in (laughs) hey what's up man how you doing we're live on uh uh soon soon we're getting yes he doesn't care he's like when do you get off (laughs) <laughs> yeah so as we get close here to wrapping up dylan likes to uh end it with a certain question yes okay uh, so if you could go back in time to the younger oh. ver- to a younger you as a kid what kind of advice would you give yourself it's gonna be okay it's gonna be okay you know uh and you don't have as much say in the matter as you think you do. So it's, it's not about, it's about working hard, right? But it's not as much about climbing as it is about kind of finding the flow and, and, and getting in the flow and going with it, you know, rather than feeling like you have to go battle some, you know, um, I, my, but I know my younger self, you would never listen to that. I'd be like, oh, uh-huh, yeah, old <laughs> right. man. Yeah, thanks. Anyway. Well, and, John. Uh, and make out and, and, and have fun before <laughs> you get old. Don't turn into, like, I have these friends and in, in they're in their 50s. They're like, God, I wish I'd partied more, sowed my oats more when I was young. And I'm like, not me. <laughs> I did not it me, all, dude. man. What the hell yeah. were you doing? I was listen i was doing everything so if, i had the if, throttle if you're in down your 20s right now don't be playing it safe man go out no, there and live do it all, <laughs> do it all. <laughs> yes Get well john with it um thank you so much for coming on here man it's it's been a true pleasure and i think it's very inspiring for people like us who are just starting almost in the industry you know learning yeah, how you keep, pitch learning how to create that team yeah. it's very motivational man and we appreciate you coming on here and speaking my to pleasure like my pleasure you know people did that for me and listen we're all we're all in the same boat here we just it, it's not you know there's room for all of us and oh. making stuff is it's amazing isn't it it's, it's it fantastic is. it's yes. the best yeah. so john as we wrap up here where can people find your work if they don't already know where it's at uh, johnlear.com is probably the best place to go. J O H N L E H R. 
Uh, why it's not pronounced John Lair, I have no idea. <laughs> My hillbilly family pronounces it John Lear. <laughs> uh, but that's, and then from there, you, you know, I'm on social media and stuff, but johnlear.com is probably the first best place to go. All right. Well, again, John, thank you so much. Um, everyone, go check out John. He does great work, and I'm sure he's working on more stuff that you'll be seeing soon. Remember, Hopefully. it's so easy a caveman can do it. There you go. That's offensive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, guys. Until next time, this has been Indie Social. Uh, we'll see you soon. Peace.